Welcome to Epilogue Podcast, the show where we discuss some stuff that happened on a different show ages ago which nobody really cares about anymore. Hi, I'm Port Ponky. And I'm LeBlanc. Today we're discussing Deep Space Nine, Season 5, Episode 12, The Begotten. Odo looks after a baby changeling, and Kira gives birth to a baby human. Double baby trouble. Yeah, that was the working title for this episode. (laughs) The titles are often so bad, that wouldn't even surprise me. The titles are usually quite abstract, and I, this is not really an exception. I don't even understand the title for this episode. Um, well, to beget is to have a kid. It What? It is? Is that some obscure definition, or is that just the definition and I don't know? That's the definition. It's not exactly up-to-date hip street talk that all the kids are using, in that it's quite an old word. But yeah, to beget a child is to have a child. Well, then it's entirely fitting. And I'm a jerk. No, they could have just called it the children or babies or births or something more or something less archaic but it's star trek they have a overt flair for the dramatic they couldn't just choose a regular word they had to choose the most specific synonym they could find anyway what did you think of this episode i i liked it for the most part It's pretty interesting to tackle parent-child relations with Odo and Dr. Mora because they aren't even related and they aren't even the same species and there are a lot of parallels there. And while it's obvious to pair one baby story with another baby story or sort of baby story, it doesn't mean it's bad. Obvious doesn't have to be bad. And... Uh, we we have that going on. I, it was jarring for me to see Shakar because we've seen so little of him. So seeing him now was kind of weird. His character is taking a bit of a downward spiral, hasn't it? Yeah, he shows up and then he's not great. He uh, was first in the episode Shakar where he was this folk hero, resistance fighter, tough guy with a heart. Then the next time he turned up was in Crossfire, where he's a sort of bumbling politician. In this episode, he's just a goofy comic relief. And insecure. Based on this episode alone, if his backstory was revealed to be that he was a resistance fighter, it would be ridiculously unbelievable. It's unbelievable to me that Kira is still with this guy. Her choice in men is very mumbly-centric. Her choice in men is actually kind of bad. (laughs) Yeah, that's one way to put it. Well, she's a strong character, so they made her like strong men that are brooding. But I don't think people just like... uh, people who are like them. For example, if Kira was a male character, um, a a tough guy with a a checkered past, they wouldn't have needed to match a male Kira up with a female who is equally tough. So it's, it's... I don't really... I don't really like the sort of men she gets matched with, but... Lots of people really do have bad choice in partners, so fair enough. (laughs) That's very true. We had so much father-son angst in this episode that Spielberg would have blown his lid. 
I liked all that stuff because we haven't seen a lot of Dr. Mora, so it doesn't feel tired or anything. And they explore a lot of areas with that dynamic. So people, some people tend to think they'll do better than what their parents did. And a lot of times narrow to something very specific. Well, my parents did this one thing and I hated it. So I will make sure to avoid that one thing. And here it's Odo and invasiveness. He doesn't want to prod this thing and he's avoiding that characteristic that Dr. Mora had. I definitely felt the Mora Odo storyline was way stronger. I felt the Kira one just was a bit ridiculous and dragged on. There's not much there in the Kira storyline. It's she needs to relax and then she struggles to. Oh, it annoys me. It annoys me so much because birth is always depicted very casually in cinema. This uh, is the most egregious yeah. example. But yeah, but they were lazy. They said, okay, so oh, it's always portrayed lazily. Let's get even more lazy and then use the excuse that it's alien. But ugh, that's just terrible. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. No, the baby just slides out. What is Kira's undercarriage like? What's the bit of anatomy there? I, and the whole get relaxed, tip the drum and the rattle and the dong thing was... I don't know if that was supposed to be comedy gold, but it wasn't. It wasn't comedy gold, and they did it for way too long. It, it's good that she's had the baby that plotline has drawn to an end. I think the only part of the Kira sort of B-plot in this episode that I liked was at the end when Kira says that she didn't care about the baby, but now she really does. Which was Nana Visitor's uh, specific request that a line or a scene such as that was added to the uh, episode. Wow, without that, there would have been nothing in that storyline that I liked. So good on her for that. Yeah, that salvaged what little remained of that storyline. So the baby changeling stuff was where this episode was at, and it was pretty cool. They did a lot of different special effects with different types of goop. If anything, I wish they'd gone further into this stuff. It's a shame it's just one episode. The relationship between Odo and Dr. Mora is... Uh, it's not used very much. It's five seasons in, it's the first we mentioned it. We know Odo had a really difficult childhood, but we never hear anything about it particularly. And then we get this one episode. It would have been nice to get more than just this, but... Everything seems hunky-dory now. It does. Uh, yes, this episode also brought the Odo is Solid storyline to a close. That was really disappointing for me. Why was it disappointing? I, I mean, I think I know what you're going to say, but go ahead. Well, what do you think I'm going to say? Because it was only 12 episodes? Yeah. And it was only really this episode and uh, The Ascent which really examined uh, Odo's character under these conditions. And I was fine with them putting off examining that aspect because I thought, oh, well, they will definitely do it later. But now they can't. It's over. It's done. And they barely touched it. It's... A great idea to make him solid, but they got scared pretty quick. Was there a backlash? Is that why this happened so soon after he became solid? Um, not that I know of. 
It was already foreshadowed in things past when Bashir said, you're not as solid as you think. So, as far as I know, this was part of the plan. All right, fair enough. I wonder if they just thought, well, this is a bad idea. Let's undo this. He definitely has more breadth as a character when he's a shapeshifter because suddenly he can do all kinds of things. So in practical terms, it's useful for them to have a shapeshifter. When he was solid, he risked becoming a one-trick pony. But yeah, even then, it would have been nice if this episode was further on in the season. Mora Paul was a bit of a hardline guy. Uh, he said, spare the rod, spoil the child. That, yeah, that was a bit um, of a surprise to me. That's as archaic as the title of this episode. <laughs> he got results. Okay, so when he pointed out, oh yeah, I got great results and all that, I had an idea, and no one ever raises this, but I wish they had. Odo is not very good at shape-shifting. And he always laments that Paul basically abused him when he was very young. Uh, he physically put him through a bunch of tests and sort of tortured him, partially unintentionally because he wasn't sure Oda was alive to for him, etc., etc. But it's never quite... The, the idea that these two things could be linked is something worth exploring, maybe. That sounds worth exploring to me. It would be quite serious, a topic, and they never raised it, so not today. It would make so much sense to raise it here. He gets way better results by avoiding his tactics, so maybe compare and contrast? It would work as a decent analogy because corporal punishment gets good results, but is very old-fashioned and cruel method of education. And then it's justified by the line of thinking which Mora expresses, everything I did to you was for your own good. Yeah, they had the, the perfect opportunity to bust this sort of issue wide open, and then it the whole episode kind of deflates a bit and gets swept under the rug. And the episode even kind of excuses it. Odo eventually thanks him, says, you did so much for me. So it's more about, hey, your parents might have been terrible, but don't burn that bridge. But it kind of excuses bad parenting. Yeah, it does. I can understand if Odo said, well, I can sympathize with what you did, but I still disagree. But he was kind of like, yeah, no, fair enough. I yeah, guess. Yeah, you tried your best, whatever. Yeah, beating me up was the right thing to do. I sp it oh, really winds me up when Cisco comes in and says, oh, Starfleet really wants reports, by the way. Why does that wind you up? Because then. Oh, first of all, it's a clunky right when they're talking about the right topic. And then Cisco says, oh, they, they want reports. And Mora Paul's like, yeah, see what kind of pressure I was under? But how <laughs> is that anything compared to the Cardassian occupation of Bajor? It's not. Yeah, I don't think Odo would be that pressured by what Cisco was asking. Just let him know what's up. That's not very demanding. Yeah, I'm surprised he wasn't told to do that from the start. It's not not difficult. And it even winds me up, because earlier in the episode, Dr. Mora says, I was never very good at keeping records of what I did. <laughs> so he's a bloody hypocrite. See what kind of pressure I was under? Well, no, because I didn't actually make any reports, so you're under a different kind of pressure. I had to make reports in my head, 
and that was stressful. Speaking of clunky timing, I really hated when Odo says, I'll never treat you the way I was treated. Bam, enter Mora. It was way too convenient. What was all that dialogue about? You, I thought you were on Earth. No, well, I was, but actually I wasn't. So I dropped it in. What? What's the point in that? What? I, why create that? Diversion for his character, a reason for him not to show up, and then also explain that there's a counter reason that adds nothing. It explains why Odo was surprised, but he would have been surprised anyway because he didn't reach out to him. So he <laughs> wouldn't expect Moro to show up regardless. Yeah, if he'd just shown up and Odo said, What well, oh, what are you doing here? And he just said, Well, there's a change thing, so here I am. That would have been sufficient and freed up about a minute and a half for them to do something else. <laughs> Quark was quoting human stuff again. What did he say this time? I missed it. He said the center cannot hold. Oh, I'm not even familiar with that. It's from a poem by Yeats. Uh, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. I think this poem is quoted in Babylon 5. So, if anyone out there is still wearing the conspiracy cap that Deep Space Nine steals everything from Babylon 5, there you go. They stole quoting Yeats repeatedly. <laughs> what a thing to steal. Yeah, no one had ever heard of Yeats before Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5. Because this happens so often when characters quote Earth stuff, I had to come up with a reason in my head why this keeps happening. And this happened during this episode because Mora says, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. And I thought, that's ridiculous that he's saying that. So I thought, all right. The computer, or the translator, also does localization. So he's saying something that wouldn't make any sense to me word for word. So it's localized, and that's why we are getting so many Earth stuff. Um, the Next Generation episode, Darmok, which is the go-to episode for discussing... Uh, Universal Translators, well, along with Deep Space Nine's Little Green Men. Uh, in Darmok, there's an alien culture that speaks entirely idiomatically. Everything is metaphor, and the Universal Translator cannot do it. It can't cope. Uh. So, maybe it can swap idioms and proverbs around, given context. But there is evidence that it Kind of can't. Oh well, it was bugging me so much I had to come up with something, but I guess that doesn't work. Well, maybe it does because it's always uh, substituting animal names in this episode. Tarkalian Hawk. I don't know why it's always Tarkalian stuff. Why is it just a hawk? It can't be just a hawk. Well, you're a shapeshifter. You can just be a generic bird. It doesn't have to be specifically any. <laughs> particular species. But Tarkalian hawks have the ideal wingspan for flying indoors. Well, guess what? The Tarkalian hawk, I'm sure, is unbelievably close to some Earth bird that I'm unable to name. But I guarantee you there's an Earth bird that is identical to the Tarkalian hawk. Probably. No, not probably. Definitely. Okay. It's a production thing. I mean, they got that bird in there and said, that's a Targalian hawk. It's clearly an earth bird. Because Targalian hawks are fictitious. <laughs> so, I, they always do that, though. They always say, oh, this guy's more pent up than a bullion bull cow. Okay. Oh, one nice little detail during that hawk scene. When he shapeshifts into it, he leaves behind a pile of clothes. And 
it looked odd to me at first, but then I realized, oh yeah, he was solid. He was wearing real clothes for a while because I'm so used to seeing him shapeshift seamlessly because he used to have to make his clothes. Well, I knew the shapeshift was coming up, so I was watching out to see if he dropped clothes or not. I couldn't recall, so I was pleased that he did. Although, another question is raised by this. He drops his clothes and his communicator, but when he reforms, he has a communicator. So he does shapeshift his com badge. Yep, he is that good. But then I came up with an alternate theory, because people were never quite sure if he shapeshifted his com badge or if he just stored it in his mass whilst he was shapeshifting. So my alternate idea is that when he was made solid, he still had his com badge <laughs> inside him. And uh, now that he can shapeshift again, he can uh, make it uh, outside his body. And that makes no sense, though, because there's many reasons why that's the stupidest thing I've ever said. <laughs> it sat next to his appendix all this time. Yeah, Bashir didn't notice. That maybe that's why he's getting all these back pains. Like, oh, <laughs> it feels like there's something like, lodged in my spine. Bashir just says, eh, nah, you're probably fine. Just slouch a bit more. That seems unlikely. It's your posture. But every time someone boppity booped him, it would come out of his body as well. <laughs> I can hear you kind of behind me. Where's that he coming from? To bang his back with his fist to answer. <laughs> Punch himself really hard. No, but they gave him another com. I so guess... he thought the com noise was always echoing because he would hear it behind himself. Yeah, as well. Like my head cannon, or. My theory is that he forgot that he was storing it in his mask when he was made solid, so he's just not aware that it's there, but he has a sneaking suspicion that there's something he's forgotten, but he can't quite figure it out. And then it all comes rushing back to him when he turns into the hawk. Yeah, because it's second nature. Yeah, it's shape-shifting is like riding a bicycle. It's like, yeah, where's the combat? Put that inside the hawk. Turn back into Odo, pop it on the uniform. <laughs> Do you have a lovely quote for us to ponder? To find out if the species they encountered posed any threat, what better way to gauge another race than to see how it treats the weak and vulnerable? That's a lovely idea, but the founders treat the weak and vulnerable horribly as something to be rid of yeah they treat solids like just almost like a virus or something yeah they're completely disposable and they murder them all the time when they feel like it so the sentiment is is fantastic and i agree that how the vulnerable members of society are treated reflects strongly upon the quality of the society itself. It's just kind of ironic that it's the founders that thought of that. Shouldn't Odo hate Bajorans then? Uh, why? If he believes in that, and then given how he was treated by a Bajoran. Well, the problem with having only one sample is it's completely anecdotal. Which I could see Odo running away with as the only evidence he needs. As if Odo would take one random thing and use it to justify increased security and loss of rights for <laughs> his subjects. So this episode is this episode is kind of weak. How have we treated it? Fairly decently. Uh, yeah. We are the judges of our own. Uh, we, we have self-judged that we are treating it fairly. I don't see any leaps in logic in that. Okay, well, let's leave this crappy episode behind and go <laughs> to the next one.